Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Matthew, the 18th chapter. Matthew 18, page 978, if you're using one of the Pew Bibles. Matthew 18. And we'll actually begin in verse 20. Excuse me, verse 12, down through verse 20. Verse 12. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. So So is it not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish? If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall, be, shall have been bound on, in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall, be, shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two or three, two, excuse me, I am having a hard time reading this for some reason, that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by the Father, my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Let's pray. God, these are strong words to us as we read them, yet we see so much love and concern in the tone of the voice of our Savior. And God, I pray that we would be those who show love to others in the body of Christ. As we talked last week, Father, from 1 Corinthians 13, we are so challenged by our lack of love so challenged by our selfishness, and so challenged, God, by our preoccupation with ourselves. God, to be concerned about others and to be concerned about what is happening in the lives of other believers, the difficulties and challenges that they may face. God, give us that kind of love, a love that acts, a love that moves into others' lives to help. I pray, God, that you would convict our hearts of our selfishness, of our pride, and that we would truly, fervently love one another. May we see the verses we have just read as the great expression of your love, a love that you want us to imitate. And God, we pray that you will be with us as we, this morning, consider the verses before us, that you will give us hearts that are open and to understand and to, uh, to apply. And we pray, God, that you will just give us um, a teachableness in these matters that are written on the pages of your word. May, may we see your word as authoritative in our lives. May we recognize, God, that it is not about us, but it is all about you and what pleases and honors and brings glory to you. We gather here today, God, because... <laughs> It's not about our needs, it's about your glory. May our thoughts be to your glory. And when you are glorified, our needs are certainly, certainly met. But Father, we pray that as a church, we will bring glory to Christ in the holiness, um, in the love that we manifest to the world around us. God, we thank you for this time that we can come together and be together in this place, and we pray that you will be pleased by all that we say, all that we do, that it will be to your glory. Uh, We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Well, we're in Matthew 18 this morning, and let me just remind you of the bigger picture of what we are doing on Sunday mornings uh, for the first two months of the year. That insert, you will notice, has two sides to it. It's the, I guess it's this uh, off yellow, whatever you call that color, insert. Um, On one side of it, it says statement of faith. And I've told you in weeks past that the most 
important document of Grace Church is our statement of faith. And I say that because these are the areas, and these are just headings now. There are much detail underneath these headings that's not on this piece of paper. But these are the things that we believe together, that we gather around these truths. This is what our church holds to. We have certain areas that we believe. There are other things that we teach, yes, but these things are essential. The essential things that we hold to and that we would say to anyone that wanted to join our church, you must affirm that you believe the things that we have under each of these categories. We just recently added uh, number 10 and 11, our congregation added uh, 10 and 11, a statement on the family and a statement on civil government. Our culture sort of makes us do things like this sometimes, put things in words to be more clear as to where we stand on certain issues. But this is an important document. This is what we believe, and we, we unite around these truths. The other side of the document is it's the 12 marks of a healthy church, but these are things that we do. What we believe is the other side. This is what we do, and this flows out of what we believe. We do these things. We encourage you to do these things. These are what we do together, and we affirm together as the marks of a healthy church, things that we believe the Bible tells us as a church to be involved in. And we have taken the first couple months of this year to examine these. We've laid aside our study of the book of Luke to look at these, and we've covered most of them, and whether directly or indirectly. And um, the main... The main purpose has been to tell you to excel still more in all of these because these are the things we do all the time. Well, today we come to one that is probably going to take us this weekend into next week, possibly, and that is number nine on that sheet. It's the exercise of church discipline. The exercise of church discipline. Um, The reformers would disagree with our statement here. The reformers would say, no, it's not the mark of a healthy church. He says, it's the mark of a church, the issue of church discipline. It's more than just a healthy church that does it. No, you're not a church, the reformers would say, unless you exercise church discipline. In fact, if you go back and read some of the confessions of, throughout church history, that has been a statement regarding the beliefs of the church the necessity, the importance of church discipline. It's not popular at all today, you know that. I would imagine that most of you probably, some of you sitting here may be saying, what in the world is he talking about? I've never heard of that. Some of you may have heard of it, but you've never seen it practiced. You have never seen it uh, done, or if you've seen it done, it was not done well. Um. And so it's one of those issues that uh, many churches do not practice at all because it's, quite frankly, very, very difficult. In fact, the men, there are men in this church who have been in leadership in the past in our church where we have had to discipline a member of our church. And they will tell you that that was the most difficult time of their time here at Grace Church. Because it's so very difficult. It's a hard, hard thing to do. There's nothing easy about it at all. We have outlined in our Constitution the steps, the same steps you see here in this Matthew 18 passage. We've tried to be true to the Bible. We've tried to say it exactly the way Jesus said to do it. But that does not make it easy. It is very, very hard. This key passage is Matthew 18. Now, that doesn't mean Matthew 18 is the only passage that talks about this in the Bible. There are other passages that talk about this. But this is the first time you see it. You see it here even before the church starts. The church doesn't start until Acts. But Jesus gives instructions in Matthew 18 on what to do and how to handle 
ongoing sin in the church. People react to this subject, and I understand that. Um, And I think a lot of times it's because they've never been taught what the Bible says. And I think also they've never seen it, like I said earlier, practiced correctly. And I'm not saying that we have done it perfectly at Grace Church. Let me answer some common misunderstandings, and I developed these from some headings, but I've kind of inserted some uh, headings that I read, but I have inserted some uh, my own thoughts into this. These are misunderstandings that you hear sometimes regarding this subject. Church discipline I'm going to state it. Church discipline is not opposed to love. Church discipline is not antithetical to love. Some people say it is. How is, how is church discipline loving? How is church discipline, excuse me, let me back that up. How is church discipline not antithetical to forgiveness? Let's say it that way. Aren't we said to forgive Well, that's what this passage is about. Jesus is outlining how to forgive. Jesus is outlining in this passage instructions on how to forgive because church discipline is about forgiving, about bringing and helping someone to repent so that forgiveness can be given. In fact, in this very passage, if you look down in verses 21 and 22, Peter asked the question, in the very context of this, how often do I forgive my brother? Seven times? Verse 22 says, you forgive him seven times 70. Jesus knows what forgiveness is about. This is not contradictory or antithetical to forgiveness. Secondly, Aren't we micromanaging people's lives in this issue of church discipline? Aren't we turning the church into some kind of Gestapo when we practice church discipline? Or some kind of Inquisition? Understand this. The sin that is being talked about in this passage is not some petty annoyance. It's not some matter of preference or opinion. It is a serious violation, a serious violation of biblical truth. It is sins that are destructive to an individual. It is sins that are destructive to other believers in the church. It is a sin that is destructive to the unity of the church. It is a sin that is destructive to the purity of the church, the testimony of the church. I mean, we're talking about something serious here. Not something petty. I'll talk about that more in a few moments. But the point is, it's a sin that must be dealt with. It's what Paul told the Corinthians. They were allowing immorality to go on in the church, and everybody knew it, 1 Corinthians 5. And Paul says, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? He goes on to say, clean out the old leaven. So it'd be a new lump. Don't associate with that man anymore if he won't repent. Don't associate with him, that so-called brother. That's strong words. But that's how serious the Apostle Paul is about the purity of the church and the, how, it, how that sin affects others in the church and affects the testimony of the church and how destructive that sin is to that individual. It must be dealt with. Must be dealt with. A rotten apple affects the whole bushel, right? We all it pollutes us all when it's that kind of a sin. People say it's inconsistent. Church discipline is inconsistent with the Spirit of Christ. But understand, I'm reading to you, I read to you early, earlier Christ's words. That if you have a red letter Bible, it's in red letters. Those are Christ's words. 
And so if you think Christ would never participate or affirm the confrontation of an unrepentant sinner who calls himself a believer, then you have a distorted understanding of Christ because that's what Christ would do. People sometimes quote Matthew 7.1. Unbelievers, this is the mantra of our age. Matthew 7.1. Do not judge so you will not be judged. Every unbeliever knows that. They have never read a single word of the Bible, but for some reason they know that verse. Matthew 7.1. It's, it's the mantra of our day. I, I heard it throughout this political campaign. And see, it proves to them, when they quote that verse, what it proves to them is that Jesus was a teacher of tolerance. That he was non-judgmental and that he was uh, non-dogmatic. He would never condemn anyone about anything and never judge anyone. And unfortunately, I've even heard believers use this verse. I understand the world not understanding it, but believers use this verse. They say we have no right to exercise church discipline to make any adverse opinions about anybody's behavior or anybody's beliefs because that would be judging them. That would be a violation of Jesus' words in Matthew 7.1. And that would be inconsistent with the Spirit of Jesus. Understand this about Matthew 7.1. That Jesus is not forbidding all kinds of judgment. He's not. He himself makes judgments about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He calls them whitewashed tombs. He says, woe to you. He pronounces judgment on them all the time. He does that in the same chapter, in fact, in 7.15 of Matthew 7. In Matthew 7.1... Jesus is talking about improper judging. He's talking about hypocrisy or condemning someone and not seeing your own sin. That's the issue there. He's talking about people who are hypercritical, people who think they're okay and everybody else is, all, is, is, a, is a mess. Talking about people, the Pharisees in particular, is who he's talking about who are harsh and fault-finding and prideful and self-righteous. People who don't see their own sin, they just see the sins of others. He's talking about that kind of judging. He's condemning that kind of judging. Because in verse 3, he says, this is what you should do. You should take the log out of your own eye first, and then take the speck out of your brother's eye. He never says, don't try to help your brother. He just simply says, before you do that, examine yourself. Look at yourself first. That changes the spirit completely. When I look at me and see my faults and my weaknesses and my sinfulness, that changes my attitude about you. I go, whoa. And, and I just say this, that we have to understand that the church is not individualistic. We're a body, the body of Christ. He is our head. We don't own the church. You don't get the privilege of coming to a church and deciding how it should be. We are, we, this is a, the church is a stewardship. It's not about everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. We, it's a stewardship. Christ owns it. He is the one that tells us how to do it. And I, I look at the words there on Matthew 18, I go, wow, that sometimes just doesn't make any sense to me, God. That's the way to do it. But you know what? He don't care what I think. He doesn't care what any of us think about it. He says this is how we're to do it, and we have to trust him and how we do things, even though, because this isn't about everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. It's doing what Christ has said, 
the way we should do it. You get, a, you get your child a birthday toy or a, a Christmas toy, you know, and it's got a thousand parts to it, right? And you, you have a choice when you open that box. You can lay the instructions over here and never look at them, which is what I do a lot of times, and just start building. And you start building it, and pretty soon you're almost done, and you've got 12 pieces left over, and you're trying to force things into places they don't go, and it just doesn't work. Because you didn't even look at the instructions. And that's how many people do the church. I will do it the way I think is right. I will do what feels good. I will do what the culture tells me is right. These words don't make any sense to me that Jesus has here. Therefore, I will ignore them and do it my own way. This seems to make more sense to me. When we have had situations in our church, and it's not been a whole lot of times that we've had to bring a, a situation before the whole church, and I'm thankful to God for that. But I would say this, I, can, I have, <laughs> on the way to church that day, I have said, God, all I'm doing is trusting your words because I don't feel in, right about any of this. I'm just, I'm just choosing to fear God and not fear man. And just trust your words that this is right. And then number four, it's not compatible with love. This is the one I meant to say earlier, but understand this about God's love. In Hebrews 12, if you want to turn there, you can, but he is... Hebrews 12 says this, verse 7, it is for discipline that you endure. See, in Hebrews, these believers had been going through a difficult time, possibly persecution, lots of trials. And the writer of Hebrews tells them in verse 7, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. Revelation says God disciplines those he loves. Discipline is the word disciple. Teaches you things. Verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 12 says, For they discipline, talking about your parents. Your parents disciplined you. For a short time has seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share, boy, his holiness. What is God's goal in disciplining us? Our holiness. That's his goal. That's why you're here. He justified you to sanctify you. He wants you to be holy. He wants me to be holy. It never seems joyful at the moment, verse 11 says, but sorrowful. I I only say this to show you that discipline is consistent with love because so many say it's not. It's very consistent with love. There's two kinds of discipline. There's a formative discipline or a preventive discipline. That's where you teach your child certain things uh, to protect them. You you say, hey, don't touch a hot stove. Uh, You know, that's a boundary. You don't go there. Don't don't play in the street. That's a boundary. I love you. I care about you. I I don't want you to get hurt. That's preventive discipline. We do that in the church. We teach God's Word. We fellowship. We exhort one another. We encourage one another. We practice the one another's. We do all of those things. That's preventive, formative discipline. That goes on in the church. But there's times when corrective discipline is necessary. That's when your child steps over a boundary and won't stop or whatever, and you're trying to, once again, bring that child back. Rescue that child. Protect that child. See, the passage in Matthew 18 is a picture of corrective discipline. This is how Jesus wants corrective discipline to look in the church. It, it, puts, his dis, it puts his discipline on display is what it does. And I'll show you, and I can show you that in the very passage, but I can't do that. I'll, I'll get there. And third, fifthly, this is the important one. The public aspect of discipline is not the first step. It's the final step. The third one being where you tell it to the church. 
But there are two steps before that. You go privately or you take two people with you. So public dis- discipline is not the first step. People hear this word church discipline and they automatically think about shunning somebody. They automatically think about putting some, excommunicating somebody. But that's not it. It's about pursuing somebody in love. It's about calling someone to repentance. It's about calling someone for the possibility of restoration. That's what we're doing. And most church discipline always stays in step one, private. 90% of the time, it's just private. It never leaves there. A church that doesn't practice church discipline is going to have problems, I promise you. They're going to have problems, serious problems. They're going to look eventually like the church at Corinth. Division, unloving attitudes, comparing with each other, immorality in the church, all kinds of abuses of love, suing each other. Just read that. I never understand why some of the churches in our city, not in our city, but in our country, call themselves the First Baptist Church of Corinth. I never understand that. I drive by and I go, Do, have they read the book of Corinthians? <laughs> Who wants to be identified with that church? That was the problem church of the Bible. But it will send a church into chaos. It will. And you know what happens? And this is what happens. Mature believers, maturing believers won't tolerate it. They'll leave. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them. Immature believers will stay. But maturing believers will not tolerate it. They'll see it. They are growing in their understanding of the holiness of God. They are growing in their understanding of uh, of the character of God. They're growing in their understanding of the purpose of the church and the holiness of the church and the effectiveness of the church. What's wrong with the American church? It's just unholy. Somebody met with me recently and told me that the problem with the American church is we're not political enough, involved in politics enough. I said, give me a break. The problem with the American church is we are got too involved in that and we forgot about being holy. People, maturing believers will leave. Your godliest people will leave. It'll stunt the growth of a church. You don't deal with, you don't deal with sin in the midst and everybody knows about it. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It affects everybody. It robs the church of its effectiveness and its power. Jesus said this, you don't have to turn there, but in Ephesians 5, in the passage talking to husbands, but he says this, Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify her, that he might sanctify her, that he might make her holy, having cleansed her and washing of the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. In Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. He wants to purify for himself a people for his own possession, he says. We're not going to be perfect. That's not what this is about. We're not going to be perfect at all. As long as we're in this flesh, one day we'll be glorified. In justification, He saved us from the, the penalty of sin. In sanctification, He is saving us from the power of sin. That's what He's doing to us right now. And one day we'll be saved from the presence of sin. I long for that day. Al Muller. He did about four articles on this topic on his website a few years ago. He says the absence of church discipline 
is no longer remarkable. Uh, let's see, the decline of church discipline is perhaps the most visible failure of the contemporary church. No longer concerned with maintaining purity of confession or lifestyle, the contemporary church sees itself as a voluntary association of autonomous members with minimal moral accountability to God, much less to each other. The absence of church discipline is no longer remarkable. It's, it is generally not even noticed. A regulative, regulative and restorative church discipline is, to many members, no longer a meaningful category or even a memory. The present generation of both ministers and church members is virtually without experience of biblical church discipline. As a matter of fact, most Christians introduced to the biblical teaching concerning church discipline confront the issue of church discipline as an idea that they have never, ever encountered before. At first hearing, the issue seems antiquarian and foreign, like the Salem witch trials, or the scarlet letter. And yet, without a recovery of functional church discipline firmly established upon the principles revealed in the Bible, the church will continue its slide into moral disillusion and relativism. Evangelicals have long recognized discipline as a mark of the authentic church. Authentic biblical discipline is not an elective, but a necessary and integral mark of authentic Christianity. I got a call from a pastor who knows that our church practices church discipline. He called me. He, wanted, he needed some advice. His, his uh, worship leader had run off with a lady in a church in another county or something. And, you know, the guy's parents go to their church and, you know, he wants, doesn't know really what to do about it because he don't want to offend the family and they're just saying we need to forgive the guy and i mean you know we just need to kind of let, you know not be confronted that's what a lot of people are saying in this little church and back and forth with all this stuff and i just said to him i said well first thing i would do and this is kind of a no-brainer fire the guy but the second thing is before you try to enact church discipline you better teach your people why you would want to do something like that if you've never taught them that before, they're going to look at you like you're from Mars. Who are you? I said, you need to teach it. You need to show people that it's not what you say. You didn't come up with this idea because this is what God's Word says. What God's Word says. I thought this was kind of neat. I read this on a response section of a blog I was reading. My wife and I are missionaries in South America. Upon returning to the USA for a visit, I met with different pastors of our church. During a conversation with one of the pastors, I was told that the church leaders made the decision they would not implement church discipline when a member willfully remains in unrepentant sin and that they knowingly tolerate unrepentant sin in the church. When asked why, the response was, the church is about relationships Grace, showing love, and unity. When pressed further, the pastor also replied that if the church would implement church discipline, the process would require a lot of work, a lot of time, and they feared people might leave the church. And I would add to this, a lawsuit. I think that's another reason people fear it. Here on the mission field, the same person, here on the mission field, we had to discipline church members and a pastor who willfully sinned and remained unrepentant. Some of the church sinning members eventually repented and were welcomed back into the church. It was very difficult, painful, and yet rewarding when fellow church members repented and returned to the fellowship with God in the church. There was much celebration and glory given to God for their return. The pastor and other members who did not repent of their sins, sins that were also criminal offenses, accused the church of legalism and maligned those who held them accountable. The leaders from our home church instructed us not, instructed us to not discipline the unrepentant pastor. Paul says, <laughs> Paul told Timothy, you do. You do discipline an unrepentant pastor. I'll read that to you next week. 
I can understand why some churches prefer not to discipline members who openly live in unrepentant sin. It is difficult. It is difficult, he says. It is painful. It can become ugly when there is defiance and not repentance. And some people will leave the church, but when done properly and lovingly, the results created within all the members are greater reverence for God. Hey, it puts fear in everybody, Paul says to Timothy. A healthy fear of God. I've had people tell me that when we have had to go through that process. I've had people beeline to me to say thank you. It is difficult, it is painful, it can become ugly when there is defiance and not repentance. And some people will leave the church, but when done properly and lovingly, the results created within all the members are a greater reverence for God, an understanding of God's holiness, and a greater love for God, for each other, and for Christ's church. It's worth, it's worth it. It's hard. It's difficult. And I understand why people don't do it. But that's no excuse. There's no excuse. It's just three verses here. That's all it is. Look at it, Matthew 18. Matthew 18, the context of 15 through 17 is back up at the very beginning. He's talking about little children. Now, these are not little children. These are, this is an illustration of believers. He's calling believers little children. You see in verse 3, Truly I say to you, 18.3, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children. See that? He's calling you like you're a child. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. So he cares about believers. He cares about those who would cause believers to stumble. It goes on through this, and then right before verses 15 through 17, and folks, these are verses that never really get read. But Jesus gives this parable in verses 12, 13, and 14. He says, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does not he leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? Look, look how much... This shepherd values a sheep that is strayed. He will leave the 99 and he will go to search for that one sheep. You got 99. What's one? No, one matters. That one matters. If it turns out he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 who have not gone astray. So it is the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. It's not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. And then, in that context, as an expression of his concern for a straying sheep, He says, I want you to be my instruments of rescuing people. You see that? Have you ever been in a Walmart or the mall and you lost your child? Maybe just for a minute, which seems like an eternity. Oh my goodness, where'd she go? Where'd he go? And I mean, it's like, If too much time passes, your imagination is going wild. All you can think about is somebody got her, or she's hurt somewhere. I mean, she was just out there in the yard, and one minute she's not there, one minute he's not there. I mean, everything goes haywire in your mind over that child that is missing. You can't find that child. 
and you do everything you can to go and find that child. Ken Ramey gives this great illustration. He says, this is like search and rescue. He says, you get in search and rescue mode. Imagine in some of the situations we unfortunately read about where people don't find their child right away and they put the child's picture up on all the telephone poles and power line poles around and store fronts around trying to find that child and they get a search party together and the search party goes out. It's search and rescue to find the child. Instead of calling it church discipline, Ken Ramey says, let's call it search and rescue. That's what you're doing. First you go search, then you call all the, everybody else to go search. That's the process, same process we're looking at here in Matthew 18. I want you to be my instruments in my hand to go search and rescue. That's what Jesus is saying. I want you to call them back to repentance. I want you to go get them. And it gives four steps. And I don't want to do those today. Because I don't want to stop, have to stop. Y'all won't let me go past 11, 30, 12.30. <laughs> but I just say to you, you'll be back here next week. You need to know this. You need to know this. These are Jesus' instructions. These aren't Rod Bunton's instructions. These aren't some Grace Church policy that we wrote up. In the context of the, we saw last week, loving one another, can you think of any, <laughs> anything more loving than search and rescue? Going and finding someone? Going to get someone? If you think of some things that you want me to address next week in this area, send me an email. Because I'm going to get specifics next week. I've got lots of specific things to say in this passage. And it's one of those kind of topics that I know there might be a lot of questions on. And no question is foolish. Just ask your question. Send it to me on my email. And I'll, I'll, I'll find ways to address that if I can. Because this is an important topic. I have not found this church, I have not found this subject to be divisive to Grace Church. I have not found this subject to cause people to leave Grace Church. In fact, I have seen this topic, this subject, grow Grace Church. Maybe not in numbers, but in certainly in the depth of our spiritual walk with Christ. So... Next week, I will continue this. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you and praise you for giving us these truths. Lord, we are challenged by what we read on the pages of Scripture. That's how it should be, God. That's how it should be. Your ways and our ways are not the same. God, your ways are much higher than our ways. And Father, we know that, Lord, you are far wiser than we are. And Lord, we just thank you for how you work in the midst of this congregation. How there are people, as we said last week, who do intentionally find ways to show love. And God, we, I praise you for that. And God, I know that this area of love that we have discussed this morning is a little more challenging for us, a little more difficult for us. But God, we want to love in this way as well. Because this is caring, truly caring about a brother or a sister in Christ. 
we're always challenged on how our, our love is going, God. We think we've arrived, and then we see something like this, we realize I'm not even close. Don't let us be content, Father, but help us to grow in this. We love you and we praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.